Because according to Levine, every object either adds value or it adds waste or muda. And so if it is contributing to muda, then you want to be skeptical about whether you should have it. If it added value for your customer, then you should probably keep it. Today I'm here with Ben Hartman, author of the book, The Lean Farm, at Ben's New Farm. Is this still Clay Bottom Farm or is this something different? Yes, it is. Still yeah. Clay Bottom Farm, Definitely. but in a different location than the farm written about in this book. And you and I, we've been talking a lot of lean stuff this morning, and one thing I wanted to talk about was Marie Kondo and the life-changing magic of tidying up, which is based upon some Japanese traditions of tidying. And I asked you what your thoughts were on that and how that could tie into Lean. Yeah, so it's one of my favorite books. I think Marie Kondo has written one of the most important books for our generation. And I say that because all this leaning up and sorting and getting rid of things we don't need, is, I think is the essential task of our generation. And it was the World War II generation, uh, their task was to build up our infrastructure. And so many of the institutions that are in place today uh, from government institutions to um, uh, mason lodges, civil service institutions. Now these were all initiated by that World War II generation. And that generation had to live through the Great Depression too. And so that generation, their task was to not throw anything away as a survival mechanism. And they needed, that had to be the task of their generation. And at this point with consumerism and uh, the material culture we live in, the task of our generation is almost just the opposite. And so where my grandparents kept every napkin they used, uh, the task of our generation is to sort through all the uh, spare parts on our farm, sort through all the tools we're not using. Uh, in the house, sort through all the, uh, so, sort through the silverware drawer. Uh, every drawer of the house, there's just way more junk and way more stuff in there than we're actually ever going to use or provide usefulness to us. And so that's our task. And what she has done is written a beautiful book that lays out a simple process for editing because uh, and what she has done is uh, make that process accessible and I think it, her process can apply to farms can apply to any type of business uh, not just in the house so what she says essentially to do is you touch every object you touch an object during this process editing process and you ask did it spark joy and so it's emotion it's an emotional question it's not there, there shouldn't be a, a lot of rational thought behind it, it should be a visceral reaction to say the hoe. Does the hoe spark joy for me? Should I keep the hoe? And so that's a bit of a weird question to ask in a business because we keep objects in a business not just because they spark joy but for their usefulness. And so what we do on our farm is once a year we actually do go around and we assess the objects we're using part of our production system and we ask a simple question is it which is did you add value for my customer in the past growing season? And so that's taking Mary Kondo's method and putting a little bit of a lean twist on it. Because according to Levine, every object either adds value or it adds waste or muda. And so if it is contributing to muda, then you want to be skeptical about whether you should have it. If it added value for your customer, then you should probably keep it. And you should put it in an easy to reach location and make sure everyone knows how to use that tool. And so that's what we've done. Every season we go around and we ask that question. Did you have value for customers in the last growing season? And then if the object hasn't, uh, then we put it in what we call a red tag holding area. And this is a place on the farm where we put things for a couple months while we're thinking it over. Should we get rid of it or not? And there's a, 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 a produce equipment and tool auction. It uh, happens twice a year around here. And if we haven't used the object by the time the auction rolls around, uh, then we get it off the property. You know, I've, I've read your book a few times and I've read Marie's book and I think both are very applicable to farming and life in general, organizing your life, getting control of your stuff. And one thing I do when I try and thin out my stuff is I've gone to this method of kind of asking, does this bring me joy? Does it provide me some sort of utility or value? And then I, I skip the red tagging thing. I mostly now, it's just gone, get just get rid of it. And I can tell you in the past year since Marie, reading Marie's book, there has been nothing that I have regretted after the fact of getting rid of. I think deep down we know whether this thing is adding value or not. And I think one of the constraints or one of the problems that a lot of farmers face or hobbyists or gardeners face is they buy something because they see it online or somebody talks about it, they think they're going to use it, they buy it, and it just 
it doesn't work as well as it should or it doesn't work for their context and they put it in a corner and they think I spent the money on this mm -hmm. I can't get rid of it yeah what would you say to that I would say that everything you keep is a cost okay now let me explain that everything you see keep is a cost and accountants, lean accountants, have this term, inventory carrying cost. And this is the cost of paying taxes on the building that the object is in. This is the cost of tripping over the, uh, the hoe as you're looking for uh, the hammer. Uh, this is uh, the mental clutter cost, the psychological cost of obscuring your view so you can't see your work, uh, of having to think way too hard uh, where you put uh, the cedar or the last places uh, you left the ship full. And so on. So you can actually calculate these costs and lean accounts will do this. So it will assign a numerical number to the cost of keeping too many objects on you. And so a lean business uh, tries to keep as few things on site in the workplace as possible. Just only those items that are absolutely necessary to add value for your customer. If you think about your situation with the tools you have on farm, right here you have a bunch of tools hanging up inside the greenhouse that we're in. How is this layout, this organization different than how you might have done it yeah. before you discovered Lean? Yeah, I, it, we, we began our farming uh, with, a, as all farms do, with, a, with lots of experimentation. And we had probably six different types of seekers. Uh, we had two tractors. Uh, we had uh, probably uh, 15 to 20 different implements. And, and, and all businesses need to begin with some degree of experimentation, figure out what's going to work for a system and what doesn't. However, what you have to do after year two or three is make this switch and recognize, hey, these are my high value items and these are processes that have high velocity for me. These are efficient processes and it's time to winnow out everything else, which is very hard to do. Uh, we were auction hounds. We'd love to go to these old farm auctions, collect these old tools. And we do have a small antique tool collection that sparked joy for us that we keep. However, we sent just, uh, we sent wagon loads, hay wagon loads of tools and materials off the property uh, because they were just bogging our system down. We might have used those items, you know, once every two or three years. However, most of those items we were never gonna use again and they were adding a cost uh, that we wanted to get rid of. How much of a cost is something like choice confusion? I mean, you have one hoe here, I'm looking on the rack, the other hoe you have up there looks to be about the exact same, maybe a little smaller. If you have five different types of hoes, all with different head styles, and they're all for specific tasks or specific crops, you run into this problem of, okay, which hoe do I need for which crop? What use mm -hmm. does this hoe provide? And then if you gotta train somebody, on five yeah. different tools to do five different things, you run into a lot of problems. By mm -hmm. paring down, you not only get it out of mind, you remove that cost, but then you remove the cost of having to know how to use everything expertly mm -hmm. instead of, in, instead you can just focus on the one thing that you really like. Yeah. So uh, one of the models I like to use is complexity is the enemy of the lead. And so anything we can do to simplify our production system, I'm going to do it. And uh, so here's the reality. We've been growing food for thousands of years as humans, okay, with very few tools. Maybe a grubbing hoe, the type of hoe that uh, would flip soil. You need something to disturb soil. Uh, then maybe you would have uh, a knife to harvest, and maybe a basket to put your produce into. However, for thousands of years, we haven't been using many more tools than those I just listed. And yet on modern farms, uh, we leaf through the seed catalogs, the tool catalogs, and we think we have to have hundreds of thousands of tools uh, to make a production system efficient. And that's simply not true. And, and in fact, the reverse is true. If you can find just you know, five or 10 key tools uh, and use those re tools repeatedly, make sure that you know how to use them well, and make sure that you can train your workers to use them uh, so that uh, everyone knows how to use every tool. Uh, that is actually a much more efficient way to operate a farm. For a lot of new farmers starting out, one of the things they might be saying when they hear that is, I don't know what to use, I don't know what's going to work. Soil conditions are different everywhere, weed pressure is different everywhere, the crops people are growing are everywhere. Just again, at hoes, there's 20 different types of hoes out there. In the beginning, how do you decide what to buy? Because you can't start at Optimum, yeah. you can't start at what's going to be perfect for your context. So how do you advise somebody to start winnowing down yeah. from day one so mm -hmm. they don't become overwhelmed? So Lean has this idea of Kaizen or continuous improvement. And the idea is that 
Uh, every week on your farm, you're continuously improving. You're winning out more tools and you're honing your system. Uh, and importantly, the important factor about Kaizen is that it's mostly an internal process, okay? Because the types of muda, the types of waste that, that we're going to have in our production system here at Clay Bottom Farm are ex extreme, extremely unique. Unique to our unique bioregion, the types of customers we have, the crops we're growing. So my production system is going to be very unique too because I'm choosing processes and tools that, that get rid of muda, that focus our efforts on value adding. And so we have a very unique system. And there is no end, there will be no end to farm courses and books and farmers who will tell you that this is the way to farm. And the system that I've developed is the only way to do it if you're going to make money. And you have to copy exactly what I'm doing. And I'll tell you right now, that simply does not work. Uh, we've tried copying other systems, and they have failed here. And if you do exactly what we do and try to take it to downtown San Diego, or try to take it to Detroit, northern Michigan, or somewhere else with a different type of climate, different range of customers, different set of crops, it's not going to work. And so one of the things that makes uh, my online courses unique is I do show you the unique system that we've developed and show you the high velocity processes that we use here. However, what makes our courses unique is that I'm more concerned about uh, teaching concepts so that you learn how to design a system that works in your own unique context. And so there are, are definitely things you need to know to farm well. You need to know what temperature to get tomatoes to germinate. And I go through that. It's a thorough course. I'm going to go through all that. Um, however, you also need to know how to make decisions so that you can steer your farm in a high profit and, and towards high productivity and profits for the long run. And, and that's going to mean being flexible. That's the nature of local food movement. Uh, CSA has seen a rapid decline in recent years. Farmers markets uh, are becoming a more challenging place to sell food. And yet there are the, all these new markets and, and higher end artisan restaurants. So we, we've had to steer our farm uh, and change our farm even the last couple of years because of shifts in the marketplace. And so uh, I'm interested in, in concepts that help you make those rapid changes uh, in your process, in your product uh, development, uh, in your crop selection, uh, so that you can remain profitable for the long haul. You know, that's one thing I really like about Marie Kondo's system, your system, or the lean farm, the lean system in general, what you talk about is, it is a base principles approach. And if you think about what we've talked about in this video, I mean, the base principles are less is more, or complexity is the opposite of, or the enemy of what? Complexity is the enemy of lean. Complexity is the enemy of lean. So, you know, you can apply that those things to a lot, whether you are in San Diego or Detroit uh -huh. or here. You know, one thing I'm looking at is, say you have a tool like this that works and you want to introduce some complexity onto it because that's kind of what our consumeristic mind wants to do. We see something in the catalog and we want to buy something new. When you look at a tool like a hoe you have here that works in your system, if you see something new that you want to get, how do you compare it against what you have that you know that works? So I'm thinking if you're going to add something new, it has to supersede and be okay. better than this. How do you analyze that to avoid bringing something on that is an equal or lesser? Because if it's an equal or lesser, I'm thinking then that's complex, yeah. that's the enemy of lean. Yeah, no, that's a great question because I, many farms, I think, get bogged on with experimentation. And it's a reason that farms fail is they they never make that pivot from becoming a high experimentation operation to being a focused high production oper operation. And so, in, gen in general, experimentation is muda, okay? And it's sexy to, to design new tools, to try out new, uh, new seed varieties. Uh, however, it's very costly. And I think especially in agriculture, it's so important to have uh, government supporting universities uh, and outreach organizations and research organizations that can that can carry the load of that cost for farmers. Okay, so in general, we tend to be very conservative with our approaches and our seed selection tools we use. We're using tried and true tools and methods. And in general, I've let others, universities, other farms, uh, uh, do the experimenting for me. Yeah. Okay. Now there are places we have bottlenecks in and uh, in our propagation house, for instance, and in, in working with the paper pot system where we become quite, you know, you know, you know, for the most part, we're not, however, we're conservative. And the rule we have is the 15% rule. And that's to say that 85% of what we're doing 
should be tried and true methods. Even on this brand new farm here, 85% of the seed varieties I ordered this year were seed varieties that I'm familiar with, and I have a production process uh, that I know will be successful with those crops, and that I, that I have known markets too. And then 15% should be experimental, and we found that that's a good balance for us. And so when I order seeds, 15% would be new seed varieties. We're trying out some new head lettuces. I have a new ginger variety right behind us here. Uh, a couple new tomato varieties. And I found that 15% is a good amount of push because you can get bored. It's, it's hard to in this business. This is a very exciting business and one of the reasons I love it is that it's never ending fascination. Uh, however, you don't want to get stuck in a rut too. And so the 15% rule would push a farmer who might have a tendency to just pair things down to one or two seed varieties, one or two markets to get stuck in a rut. And 50%, so it pushes you, and it also limits those farmers who maybe try to experiment a little too much. And I put myself in that category. 50% uh, rule, more it, it limits what, uh, it limits me so that I'm pushed to, to produce and be highly productive with the products and processes that I'm familiar with. And, and not do too much experimentation. So if you see that new hoe you like, test one a year, not five a year, and I'm thinking if you're going to try something, mm -hmm. you're looking at, hey, is there a bottleneck with this hose, something that is labor, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard on my back or mm -hmm. something like that, or can I do time savings or something like that, or my workers don't like it? Uh -huh. So Lean would have a term, the Hashin process. You figure figure out your, your most constricting, uh, the most constricting point in your flow, in your process. So the common term would be bottleneck. So you focus on uh, those bottlenecks that slow down your flow the most and, and find some tools that might uh, alleviate the muda in that particular point in your timeline, your product development timeline. And so you're, you're focused about your research, your development, your experimentation. So Hashin, muda, two terms that might be unfamiliar, but you can read about them in your book. You can listen to Ben on podcast interview that I've done with Ben. I'll also have more podcasts with Ben coming up in the fall. And of course, they can learn more about everything lean in your online course. Where can they go to find out more about that? Uh, sure. Well, first you can go to Diego's uh, webpage, Permaculture Voices. And then you can also purchase the course. Uh, sign up for the course on claybottomfarm.com. So this is the first year at our new property. And we are doing lots of building, lots of construction. And what I'm doing is putting 10 years of farming practice turning it into a three-dimensional farm here using lean principles from the very beginning. So I'm very excited about this. Uh, it's two-day workshops in September. Uh, check out claybottomfarm.com uh, for more information. We're going to talk about greenhouses, propagation houses, driveways, irrigation systems. Uh, you'll get plans for our barn house. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, all the pieces of infrastructure needed to start a farm so that you can begin farming efficiently uh, from year one. And again, check out claybonfarm.com for more information on that work, workshop.